All right, uh, everyone, uh, uh, thank you for staying in this session. And my name is Junlu. I'm a faculty member at the University of Alabama, and I'm so uh, uh, honored to uh, moderate this session uh, titled Safety and Control in Translation Systems. And we really have a diverse uh, 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 list of topics and uh, from six uh, groups. And uh, I'm going to first introduce the first uh, topic. Uh, the title is Handling Based Stopping Site Distance Reliability Analysis, uh, given by uh, Dr. Choi Kim. And Dr. Choi Kim is a, a recent graduate of uh, Virginia Tech, and he received his PhD from the Department of, Department of Mechanical Engineering. And his research is at the intersection of mechanical and civil engineering as it pertains to the highway safety. And in particular, his research seeks to understand how the geometric design of highways would impact the vehicle dynamics and vehicle handling cap capability. And conversely, how a rigorous understanding of vehicle handling can inform the design of the future highways. And he's, he's currently working at MassWorks as an engineer in the engineering department group. All right, Troy, now the uh, time is yours. Uh, you may share your screen. Let me stop my sharing. Where can I stop my sharing? Oh. I can't find where I can. I, I, OK, it's right here. Yeah, I think if you go to the top of your screen, there should be like a red button that says uh, shop, stop sharing. Uh, Hopefully I you just all have can. Several screens in front of me. I I, I was trying to find which monitor okay. I should look at. <laughs> okay. Um, am, am I all set? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Well, uh, I guess good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's great to be here, and I'm very honored to be here. Uh, first, before I want to present, I want to thank you know Dr. Liu for moderating the session, and then also give um, a thank you for Dr. Cockleman and Dr. Handy for your very insightful keynote presentation. It certainly gave me a lot of things to consider uh, as I move forward sort of in my own personal journey into transportation. So as Dr. Liu said, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Troy Jason Kim. I just finished my, gra my grad school from Virginia Tech this past spring, and I was with the Virginia Tech Department of Mechanical Engineering. And so one thing I'll, I'll note is that I, I think this, this uh, conference is really great because it brings together a bunch of people from all different majors and disciplines. And, uh, I'm personally one of the only mechanical engineers who actually works in the transportation industry that I know of. Most of my mechanical engineering friends work in robotics or medicine or something. So I would love to connect with any other mechanical engineers in the industry. So the paper I'd like to present today really deals with the notion of stopping site distance. So for the uninitiated, every road is designed with some sort of safety feature built in. And so one of the safety features we commonly see on roads is a stopping site distance, which ensures that there's enough roadway length to prevent collisions with some sort of object. And so stopping site distance is this long equation and you know, the, the details of which aren't important, but the stopping site distance is comprised of two main components. The first component is how far the car travels in the time that it takes for you as the driver to react to some sort of object in the road, and then finally, the braking distance, which is how long it takes the car to actually travel uh, from the time when you apply the brakes to when the time the vehicle stops. And so ideally, what would happen is these roads are designed with enough of a buffer in between such that from the time it takes for you to perceive some sort of obstruction to the time that it takes for you to bring your car to a complete stop, you won't be colliding with this object in the road. And this seems all fine and well, but the big issue is that many of the parameters used to determine what the actual stopping site distance is are deterministic in nature, and they're drawn from empirical driver studies, which were conducted you know, coming up on 80, 90, 100 years ago now. And so because these parameters are deterministic, what the uh, civil engineers had to do is they had to make these parameters unrealistically large in order to provide sort of this artificial safety buffer in the calculations. And the second issue with the timing of the driver studies is that these parameters may be outdated due to differences in not only driving styles, but driving habits over time. And this is especially pertinent with things like autonomous vehicles, where if we expect autonomous vehicles to outperform human drivers, then we might need to rethink 
what the SSD parameters are, because if we're using human-based parameters and we're applying it to autonomous vehicles, then there might be a little bit of a mismatch there. So let me just preface all of this by saying that the current stopping site distance values that are currently used in road construction have resulted in safe roads. So it's I'm not approaching this problem from you know something like stopping site distances are inherently unsafe or there's some sort of critical safety component that we're missing. I'm looking at it from the aspect of here's another way to look at stopping site distances that might be more intuitive. And I think this is a really big sticking point because one of the main criticisms of stopping site distances nowadays is that they're difficult to justify for the aforementioned reason. So what I aim to do in this work is to recast stopping site distances, not based on these deterministic quantities, but now if we say that some of these quantities are uncertain, well, how, that might, how might that affect the roadway length that we need to bring vehicles to a stop? So just a little bit of background, uh, I'd like to talk about the concept of the performance margin. So first off, every vehicle has a specific handling, braking, and quartering capability. And so you might have heard this thing called the GG diagram or the performance envelope, and it essentially plots the amount of braking and cornering a vehicle can you know, operate at. And this is largely a function of the tire road uh, pavement friction coefficient and road geometric, such as the slope and the grade. All right. So what you're going to notice here is that there is an ellipsoid shape, and this ellipsoid shape is the available acceleration. So based on how much friction there is between the tire and the pavement, that will determine the amount of tractive force your vehicle can generate, which in turn dictates how much you can brake or how much you can corner, how aggressively you can brake or how much you can corner. And so when you as the driver um, press on the brake pedal or the throttle, you're requesting a specific amount of acceleration to be supplied. And so that's called the required acceleration. And the idea is that the required acceleration is pretty much always less than or equal to the amount of available acceleration supplied by the road. And so there's this metric that we can use in vehicle handling called the performance margin, which is essentially the straight line minimum distance from whatever acceleration or cornering you request to however much can be achieved based on the road. And so we can see here that the larger the performance margin, the closer you are to the origin, and that means the more dynamically stable you are. Whereas if you request a, um, an operating condition that's on the border of this ellipse, then that means you're on the precipice of tire saturation and spinning out. So you, ideally, you want to keep your performance margin as high as possible. And so the, the second part of this work really intertwines uh, the performance margin with reliability analysis. And reliability analysis is sort of an up and coming topic in the transportation field. So I thought I'd give a little bit of, of a background. So reliability analysis was really born out of the structural engineering discipline. If you think about it from a building's perspective, let's say you have some sort of load that you're applying to a building, be it either like a wind force or maybe an earthquake, and then you also have some resistance. So you can model the building as some sort of elastic structure. And let's say the load and the resistance are both probabilistic in this case. And if that's the case, you can, pro you can plot the probability density function. And what we're looking at is the amount of overlap between the load and the resistance curves. And so the amount of overlap is defined as the probability of failure. And so if you have more of an overlap between the two curves, and there's a greater chance that the load will overtake the resistance and your building will fall down. And so that's been uh, sort of applied in a sense to the transportation realm. Instead of having one equation for the load and one equation for the resistance, what the structural engineers have done is that they've combined these into what's called a limit state equation, G. And G is really just the resistance minus the load. And because the resistance and the load are normally distributed, then it follows that the mean of G is just the difference in the means and the standard deviation of G is some function of the standard deviations of both the load and the resistance. And so now that we've combined both the load and the resistance into a single function, we can redefine the probability of failure of the structure or entity as the probability that G is less than or equal to zero. And sort of what that means in this context is, is if G is less than or equal to zero, then the value of the load is greater than the value of the resistance. And so that's when you experience failure. 
And when we're quantifying reliability, there's this uh, important uh, quantity called the reliability index beta, which if you plot the bell curve of G is the straight line distance between the origin and the mean of G expressed in terms of how many standard deviations of G we are away from the zero line. And so the higher the beta value, the further the failure line is away from the mean of G. And that means a smaller portion of the graph of G is less than zero, and that leads to a lower probability of failure. So in structural engineering, um, they usually use different values of beta as a target for design. And so in transportation engineering, um, this is you know, once again a very new topic in the field, but some researchers have decided that a beta of three, which corresponds to a one in 741 chance of failure is an acceptable level of failure. And you know, like, like I said, this is all relatively new. So there are some practitioners who are arguing that for transportation systems, maybe a beta of either four or five or even higher is more appropriate, but there's no consensus now. Uh, the main key indicator is that we can use these different values of beta to help key us in on relative failure chances and use that as design targets. Okay, so if we're going back to the idea of a performance margin, one of the biggest questions has been, what is considered a good performance margin? So let me just give you an example. Let's say it's a pretty rainy day out, and so the coefficient of friction between the tires and the pavement is really low. Let's call this 0.241 Gs, for example. And let's say you want to brake suddenly because you didn't react to a vehicle stopping in front of you. So you are requesting a brake of about 0.2 Gs. And so the performance margin would just be the straight line distance between what you request and the maximum you can request. And so that leaves you with a performance margin of 0.041 Gs, or about one sixth of you know, the distance between zero and the maximum braking capability. So you might be tempted to think, well, it doesn't seem like we have that big of a margin, but it would be nice to quantify that in terms of a probability of a skidding failure. And so that's what we can do here. We can marry the performance margin and reliability analysis to tell us, given a performance margin, what does that translate to in terms of a failure probability? And so what I did here, um, I'm not gonna go through all the math, but I made some simplifying assumptions that can help us um, sort of understand how the performance margin is related to a failure probability. So what I did here is that I'm assuming mu, the tire pavement friction coefficient, um, is probabilistic, and that the standard deviation is some sort of scale multiple of the mean value of mu. Now I'm saying that the acceleration the driver requests is deterministic, but that deterministic acceleration or deceleration is once again a different scale multiple, of our mean value of mu. And with a bunch of hand wavy math, we can conclude that the probability of failure is just some function of these two scalar multiples. And so what we can see here are four plots. Um, on the, the left-hand column is just the 3D plot and the right-hand column is just the 2D plot sort of in contour mode. But there are a few interesting observations we can take away. So when your vehicle is not accelerating or has a very low acceleration, that means the alpha value is very low. And so we can see that regardless of what the standard deviation of the tire pavement friction coefficient is, you have a very high, or sorry, a very low probability of failure. And so what we can see here is that when alpha equals one, AKA when the required acceleration equals the available acceleration, you are operating on the precipice of instability and that lends itself to a 50% chance of having a skidding failure. And now let's say that you request an acceleration or deceleration that is far greater than what the road can actually provide. That means you have a greater than 50% chance of skidding out, which should make sense because if you're, if you're requesting some sort of maneuver that the road can't provide, then your tires likely will saturate. And so all of this is really in line with common sense. And the key takeaways here is that when we're talking about things like the tire pavement friction coefficient, well, that's just inherently uncertain in everyday life. And in my opinion, this should be accounted for in the design stages of stopping site distances. And so now what we've done here is that we've established a link between the tire pavement friction coefficient and what deceleration you need to provide in order to obtain some sort of uh, desired probability of failure or reliability index.
right? So this is going to be really important in sort of the, the second formulation when we bring this in with stopping site distances. So here at the top is the equation for stopping site distances. And then what you're going to notice here is that the practitioners use this value a max. And this deterministic value has a value of 0.35 Gs. And this was empirically derived based on driver performance studies. And the practitioners have decided that this is sort of um, meant to represent the 85th percentile braking performance in pretty much all conditions. Um, but this sort of uh, was problematic to me because this isn't you know, artificially inflated and so therefore may not actually represent near worst case driving conditions. And second, Amax is a deterministic value, but as I just mentioned, the actual mechanism underpinning braking performance is the tire pavement friction coefficient, which is inherently probabilistic. So in my mind, it makes more sense to treat SSDs not as a deterministic quantity, but as a probabilistic quantity because we have some notion of uncertainty in the design variables that we're using. So one change that I decided to make, which may seem very innocuous, but actually has a lot of um, depth, is to swap out this A max with the tire pavement co coefficient of friction mu. And so when that happens, um, there are a couple of consequences. One, the SSD now becomes probabilistic in nature. And two, we can now express the SSD in terms of the available acceleration. So if you go way back to slide two or three when I was talking about the performance margin, this mu plus or minus tan theta s term is by definition the available acceleration. That's how much acceleration the road and, the, and its geometric um, features can provide to the vehicle. So now this allows us to link stopping site distances to a probability of failure. And so what I did here is I um, took the stopping site distances and I plugged in some two different values of the tire pavement friction coefficient. So the left-hand column says, let's say we have, let's say a dry road, a dry sunny road, and that corresponds to about a mean mu of 0.7 Gs. And on the right column, I decided to, to plug in a, a mu value that's about half that, about 0.35 Gs for two reasons. One, because this represents sort of the higher end of a wet road when you might start to hydroplane. And two, 0.35 Gs is what is currently used in the, um, in the uh, Ashtill Green Book. And so what we can see here that if we want to obtain different values of beta, then we have to make the roads substantially longer. And current stopping site distance values are actually, um, they, they sort of uh, correspond to a beta value that's under this 3.0 recommendation here. And so just to you know, sort of conclude on this, the current SSD values are, de are computed deterministically and without the tire pavement friction coefficient, even though in actuality, they should be treated as probabilistic. And let me just sort of conclude all this by saying once again that the safety impact of this is unknown. This needs to be studied in the future, but we can already see from you know, the graphs shown in the previous slide that there can be some room for improvement based on um, the current SSD values, All right? So thank you for your time and your attention, and I'll be happy to field any questions. All right, thank you, uh, Troy. And uh, anyone have a question? All right, I'm um, Robert, I can ask a quick question there. Uh, it's sure. uh, I think it's a really good research and uh, it brings a lot of theoretical uh, 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 analysis and um, I think it's very solid. Uh, but however, I mean, this we're talking about is a highway design. It's a uh, safety is really important. And uh, when we talk about safety, sometimes it's really conservative. Uh, we 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 can't do. I mean, there are a lot of research they are saying we want to reduce the cost or optimizing uh, optimization. But just safety is just a little bit different. Uh, we just want to make sure it's really really safe. And, and also. I'm not sure actually the SSD or is part of the legal standards or highway designs. Uh, it's just uh, when there is issues with the crashes or accidents and the lawyers will come to examine the roads. If the roads are not designed according to some SSD standards, the, I mean, the, the government, the, the DOT will be sued. 
but how do you kind of relate your uh, kind of your research to the to help them uh, make sure the SSD is really sufficient uh, if they follow your way to design the roads? Yeah, so I think this ties in with uh, Laurel's question in the chat too uh, about sort of wide scale uh, probabilistic implementation. So by far the biggest barrier to this is what you mentioned, the legal aspect. And um, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I, I don't know right now if there's a good answer as to how a legal case would be treated based on probability. And I'm not sure if there's even a precedent for that right now. Um, but what I can say here is that um, showing that probably, well, I guess prob one of the purposes of probabilistic based design is to sort of reduce the amount of, I guess, over conservative bloat in the, in the highway sort of field that we see here now. So yes, even though we could just slap a, a huge factor of safety onto all the roadway designs, it really boils down to what we want as transportation engineers. So if we want efficiency, then in my opinion, it is in our best interest to adopt wide scale probabilistic implementation because we can, instead of you know using these large over conservative factors, we can use probabilities of skating failures or rollover failures instead, and that can help sort of slim, slim down the roads. All right, thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, we are now have to move forward with uh, for our second presentation uh, titled, How Does EV Crash Differ from the IC EV Crash? Uh, this is a case study uh, in Pennsylvania. And this talk is going to be given, I'm assuming it's going to be given by uh, Lin Jie Xu, who is my PhD student and also Dr. Amy Xu, who is a postdoc at the University of Texas, Austin. All right, then uh, who is going to present? Uh, I will present, Dr. Liu. All right, then go ahead to share screen. Can I see my screen? Yes, you only have 20 minutes. Okay. So hello everyone, my name is Ninja Xu and I'm a PhD student in University of Alabama. So today I will represent our team to present this work. How do EV crashes differ from SEV crashes in a comparative study of Pennsylvania? So first, I'll introduce our team member here. So me and Dr. Yiming Xu from, uh, and Dr. Jun Liu and Dr. Jun Feng Jiao. So in this presentation, we will uh, introduce the background of this study first, and then we will talk about the data set, and then we will uh, talk about our result, including the uh, special distribution of the EV and SEV crashes and the uh, temporal distribution of uh, EV and SEV crashes and some uh, cascade test results. So in this study, we combined uh, battery electric vehicle and plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and hybrid electric vehicle together. We call them as uh, electric vehicle EV here. So EV sales had more than triple between 2020 and 2022 globally, and recent market share of EVs has brought increased public attention to their safety and incidents involving them, and EVs exhibit unique crash patterns compared to uh, internal combustion engine vehicles, like our sedan, our SUV, and due to their distinct operational features and user demographics. And exiting comparative analysis of crashes involving EVs and SAEVs are usually based on the data set with limited uh, sample size. And it's really hard to identify EV crashes in the crash report and large scale crash database. Uh, base. For example, in Alabama database, so the only way we can infer whether that a uh, crash is EV or not is uh, the uh, the vehicle model vehicle uh, vehicle made. It's really hard to do that. And also, like uh, we showed an example here in the Pennsylvania crash database, it it is very comprehensive database, but there are no indicator about whether the a vehicle is EV or not. So it's really hard to identify it uh, from the crash database directly. So, uh, and then comparative analysis of special temporal patterns of EV involved and SAEV involved crashes are lacking. 
So that's why we did this, this research. And then for the data, we picked Pennsylvania data. I, as I said before, it's, it is a very comprehensive data set and it is open sourced. So, and Pennsylvania is uh, really a pop, uh, top five popular uh, states in the United States. And they have two big metropolitan areas, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And then it, geographically, they have a large rural area and uh, Appalachian Mountain here. So it's very interesting. And then we picked the uh, 20 the data from 2020 to 2022 and we use all of the subset in that database like, like crash vehicle flag person and road information and we show the table here you can see from 2020 to 2022 the ev crashes are increasing and there are um more than at least more than 2000 but the SEV crashes, the number of SEV crashes that are relatively stable here. And the Pennsylvania data, data set, they provide the partial VIN for uh, each vehicle. So then we can use the partial VIN and the NHTSA VIN decoder tool to get the vehicle information via the Python script. So like we show in these figures, can just put the uh via in, in the decoder tool and then we decode it and then we will get some information like the electrification level. It can show it is a BEV or HEV or something else. So we can use this to identify whether this vehicle is EV or not. So based on the crashes from the data set, so we generate a map here. So the orange spots, they are EV crashes. So they the EV crashes exhibited a higher concentration in metropolitan areas, especially in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And also the blue spots, they are like as EV crashes. So they, are, uh, they were scattered throughout the state. And a significant portion of EV crashes took place in large city and along the primary road linking these urban centers. Then we also generate maps by, uh, by the census tract level, so like we show here. And from these maps, we found that urban areas around large cities such as Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and State College had a, a higher proportion of EV crashes, and the southeast region of Pennsylvania, particularly around Philadelphia had the highest proportion of EV crashes compared to other regions. After that, we did the temporal uh, analysis here. We just plot them. So the first, the left-hand side, we show the monthly count for EV crashes and SEV crashes. So, uh, so you can see from this figure, the number of EV crashes increased faster than SEV crashes from 2020 to 2022. And the left-hand side, we show the, uh, sorry, right-hand side, we show the EV and SEV crash count for different hours of the day. So we can conclude that uh, a large proportion of EV crashes occur during the daytime compared to SEV crashes and the EV crash frequency exhibited greater variability uh, throughout the 24 hour cycle compared to SEV crash. Then we did a, a category tag to see if there is any difference between uh, SAEV and EV involved crashes by different attributes. So here is uh, the result for the crash severity. So the difference is statistically significant. And then we can see the EV crashes have a higher percentage of uh, possible injuries than SAEV crashes in Pennsylvania. And then if it crashes have significantly lower percentage of fatal and suspected serious injuries compared to IC EV crashes. Then is some other factors like uh, the illumination and the wiser and the intersection. So the left hand side we showed uh, two factors here. 
one the first one is illumination second one is uh weather so we can say the most of uh EV and SEV crashes happen uh in the daylight and the clear weather condition and the higher percentage of uh EV crashes occur under daylight condition and also under the uh, dark street light com uh, lighting condition but for SEV there are higher percentage of SEV crashes happen under the dark without any light and for the weather uh it uh in raining day and snow uh snowy days there are higher percentage of SEV crashes happen and let's take a look at the intersection uh so a higher percentage of EV crashes occurred at intersections compared to SEV crashes. And especially for the signalized intersection. And but for the unsignalized, uh, unsignalized intersection, there are still like higher percentage of EV crashes, but the difference is smaller than in signalized intersection. And regarding some pre-crash behaviors, uh, so in this database, we can now say, okay, this behavior is, is, is from the EV or SEV, but we can just see it. there is the behavior here. So aggressive driving was more prevalent in EV crashes compared to SEV crashes, and higher percentage of EV crashes were related to some size, uh, traffic signs and traffic signal violations than SEV crashes, and also, uh, for the DOI, SEV had a higher percentage of the DOI crashes, whether the echo related or the drug related. So in this study, like uh, we compared EV and ICEV crashes through uh, special temporal analysis and statistical tests, and EV crashes were more con concentrated in metropolitan areas, where EV ICEV crashes were scattered throughout the state. And EV crashes have a higher percentage of possible injury and lower percentage of fatal and suspect serious injury compared to SEV crashes. And a higher percentage of EV crashes occurred under daylight condition and at intersection compared to SEV crashes. And aggressive driving and the running, uh, running red lights or stop signs were more prevalent in EV crashes compared to SEV crashes. And for future research, we can expand the coverage of data and also we can do the injury severity analysis for EV drivers or uh, and the SEV drivers. And also we can do some safety analysis with some safety feature variables. That's our thought. So thank you for listening. If you have any question or any thoughts, please just feel free to ask or discuss with us. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, thank you for uh, getting our uh, schedule back on track. Uh, all right, uh, there is a uh, there are a couple of questions actually. That, that if you can look at the charts, the first question is: Was the increase in EV crashes proportional to their growth in the market share over those years? That's a really good question. So, actually, we didn't compare it, but my thought is they have the positive relationship but we need to check yeah uh i found a paper uh that basically shows actually the proportion of the crashes um the ev crashes among all the crashes um and, and also the uh over the years uh and looks like yeah it's growing but this is for low base not for united states uh um I think that's some aspect we need to examine. Yes. All right. There is another. Uh, there is another one. Uh, from uh, from uh, from Julia. Uh, is an EV crash defined as any crash involving EV, regardless of other vehicles involved or regardless of who was at fault? Uh, so EV crash here just uh, based on if there is one or more EV involved in that crash. So that means as long as there is one EV, so then crash yes. is labeled as an EV involved crashes. Yes. All right, good. Okay, we have a question from Bonnie. Uh, do you have any insight to why EVs are overrepresented 
in the factors you just mentioned in your presentation? I think it is because of the uh, special distribution. So we can see, sorry. From the maps here, so you can see the most of EV crashes happen in the cities and metropolitan areas. So there are, but for the SEV crashes, they were more uh, scattered, right? So for these factors, it's some somehow related to the uh their geographically distribution. For example, the lead condition, like in the cities, there should be more less than the uh rural areas. And also uh for like sorry, the intersection. So there are more signalized intersection in the city, so that's that might be why there are some difference here. Yeah, this is uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, I think this is great. And uh, I'm personally just uh, curious about the crashes from China because now China has just uh, way over, uh, I mean, many, many EVs on the road. Uh, and United States, I still, and California may be, there is significant portion of the EVs in the fleet, but for the other states, I just thought there is really significant portion. All right, uh, thank you, Ninji. And now let's uh, move on. Okay, there's one more question actually from uh, uh, from Ramen. Uh, is not a psychological factor for getting more crashes for EV vehicles, um, I'm not sure I understand it. Correct, understand it. Uh, uh, I think it's like in we totally use uh field uh Pennsylvania data set, but we cannot find these detail factors in that data set. So maybe if we can find those data, we can put these factors in our analysis in the future. All right, sounds good. Thank you, I hope that answers your question. Uh, all right, let me share my screen. All right, now let me uh, introduce our third uh, talk uh, titled Roadside Tree Clearing and Traffic Crashes in the State of Georgia, uh, given by uh, Dr. Alan uh, White. Uh, Dr. White is associate uh, assistant professor in Department of Landscape Architecture at Sunny uh, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And since um, uh, there is actually active hurricane going on, uh, Ellen is unable to present live. I mean, they may be on the way. Uh, and now, I mean, I'll ask Mohammed to play the recording. Uh, I would also appreciate Dr. White for providing the recording ahead of the time. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellen Edinger White. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Landscape Architecture at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, SUNY ESF. I'm also a transportation researcher, and I am happy to be here to share with you guys today. I'm going to talk about roadside tree clearing and traffic crashes in the state of Georgia. This is a case study, and I'll tell you more about it. Uh, just a little bit of background about me. I'm an urban planner and also a landscape architect, and I finished my PhD in planning and public policy at Rutgers. My co-author is a professor of ecology and evolution and natural resources at Rutgers University. So here's an outline of what I'll go over today. There is the problem statement literature, and then I'll focus on the case study, which was published in Landscape and Urban Planning this past year. So for folks who may not know a lot about roadside vegetation management, um, this is the 
general problem statement for this research, roadsides should be safe for all drivers, including those who make mistakes and run off the road. So that's just our premise here. Um, but large scale indiscriminate roadside tree clearing has steep costs and that has been happening a lot more um, in states across the country. I'll talk a little bit about that. A definition of large scale tree clearing. This is from Connecticut DOT. The removal of trees in the clear zone for a distance of one quarter mile or more or more than 100 trees within a total distance of a quarter mile or less. Some of the costs to departments of transportation for large scale tree clearing is replanting costs, managing public outcry, which can be a large, uh, a large cost, and then also lost carbon credits. So replanting for beauty, for placemaking, for erosion control, improve water quality, reduce stream sedimentation, there are a host of things. Um, also for protection against invasive species that move in quickly when you remove uh, vegetation at this large scale. Also managing public outcry, having to regain public trust can actually be a steep cost for departments of transportation that we may not always think about. Ameliorating public concerns and then um, a lot of times designing to clean up a, a roadside is a lot harder than designing ahead of time with in, in conjunction with engineers and planners. So here's just a smattering of roadside uh, uh, outcry based on roadside tree clearing the last uh, 10, 9, 10 years. This is from Connecticut. This is from Pennsylvania. This is from South Carolina, Georgia, Maine, Oregon, California. So it's, it's a problem that occurs a lot. Um, there are lost carbon credits uh, that, that occur when this happens. And I want to go over a little bit of literature about what we know about tree crash severity and contributing causes. Tree crashes are about 10% of annual traffic deaths, um, and this has been pretty steady for decades. There are contributing causes of traffic crashes that are not always reported, so speed is a huge contributor, um, intoxication, driver age, uh, curvature and road geometry, vehicle weight, and also nighttime driving. Um, and I want to point out that um, the, some tree crashes are not related to trees. I mean, that's what this NCHRP study from 2003 talked about, is that studying the role of the actual tree in the crash is, um, is something that's not always done. Um, we also know that trees slow traffic and that wider clear zones on the side of the roads can increase speeds. This is a quotation from one of the original encroachment studies that happened in the 1960s before the clear zone was implemented. This says roadside clumps of trees do seem to be beneficial as roadway delineators, but this is something that we've lost in a lot of the literature when we're um, when we've been implementing planning. A lot of uh, a lot of roadsides are just cleared of trees, and without looking at these benefits to speeds, um, it's starting to change in urban areas. But as far as departments of transportation uh, on managing rural highways, um, it's still pretty much take the trees out is is a lot of a lot of the guidance. There are tr roadside trees are assets. Here's a really large list. I'll go quickly. Um, they contribute to carbon sequestration, habitat provision, erosion control, heat reduction, um, not just in urban areas, but on a large scale too. There was just a study that came out about the Southeast and actually uh, temperatures reducing on a regional scale because of uh, reforestation that's happened over the last century. Um, carbon capture or uh, capturing air pollution, excuse me, and also placemaking and beauty, and they actually also reduce driver frustration and stress. Also, we know that um, the benefits are underreported. People love roadside trees. There are a lot of studies about this, uh, and uh, uh, internationally as well. Um, and even reducing a few can reduce landscape connectivity, which relates to habitat. So I conducted a case study um, in Georgia which started a right-of-way, they called it right-of-way reclamation in 2017, and that means they were cutting down every tree, all trees across all of their property. Um, and they, they justified it by saying that there had been a lot of tree crash fatalities, but there is no granularity to that, to, to that where, where these crashes were, which most of them were on two-lane roads and not these interstates where they were clearing. But the backlash was swift and multi-pronged. So this was a, an interview from another part of the study that I'm not going to present on today. But this person said, the clearing so extreme that in some cases you get disoriented because you don't know where you are. It happens so fast, it's like a moonscape. So this placemaking uh, part was completely um, gone. This is a, a satellite image 
or an aerial image of an interchange. You can see all the trees in the interchange here. This is just southwest of Savannah, I-16 and 516. And this is uh, the red outlines where, where the trees were removed. Um, I'll just go back again. It was all forested in there. And so this is just an example of what they did statewide. And this is what it looks like from the driver perspective. And some people that I have um, presented this with have said, well, there's a guardrail there. And yes, this is what we call indiscriminate tree clearing. It was not done in reaction to tree crashes specifically along specific corridors. It was just a blanket policy for the whole state. So my research questions are how much land was cleared in the name of traffic safety? And was there a causal relationship between the large scale tree clearing and a change in tree crash fatality rates? We looked at interstate corridors in Georgia and we drew a, about a 60 meter buffer, about 200 foot buffer around the interstates. This is a large estimate um, based on some uh, interviews with ecologists and also from this federal highways um, reference here. Um, step one was doing a remote sensing analysis. Step two was a crash trend analysis. And then step three was causality. Um, so for remote sensing, we used the National Agriculture Imagery Project, which is one meter um, resolution. You can see the difference here between the very common Landsat images, which are 30 meter resolution. Um, so we then uh, we got this imagery. We used land cover change detection in ArcGIS Pro. So we classified 2015 with and 2021 because the program started in about 2017. And for the NAEP imagery, um, that's available about every two or three years. So we looked at 2015 to ensure that we were uh, pre-treatment or pre-tree removal. And, um, and then 2021, which was when a lot of the uh, trees had been removed already. And then we looked at accuracy tests on those classified data sets and then compared uh, 2015 to 2021 to see where forested land had changed to um, either barren or herbaceous cover which means grass or um, low plantings. So we looked at where forest uh, along these roadsides uh, changed into a different land classification. And we found that almost 25% of the roadside forest, almost 25% of all the trees in these large buffered areas along these interstate corridors uh, were removed. That's over 7,000 acres of forest. And you can see here some of the statistics on the carbon storage, the sequestering per year, um, almost 13,000 metric tons. Um, and I, we looked at different, uh, the different interstate corridors. So these are the, the sums there, um, looking at how much of the forest was removed on, on each one. But statewide along interstates only, it's about 25%. And this is just looking at the model. Um, to, to show how that worked. So there's the NAEP image for 2015 and the same place for 2021. You can see all that tree, all the trees were removed. And there's the, um, the model results on the bottom where it counted as tree removal. The same thing for an interchange. And this is a different interchange. You can see there are fewer trees in the pre-treatment image and the model captured that accurately. And I want to point out here that um, the clear zone is typically, it's, it varies by speed and slope and traffic volume, but it's typically understood to be about 30 feet. And I just want to illustrate here that this interchange, it's more than 400 feet across. So this was a traffic safety project, but they just took out, they took out everything. Um, so looking at crash trends, I grabbed the crashes from the GDOT portal. It was a new metric portal online uh, for 2013 to 2021 and filtered by first harmful event for trees and um, normalized by vehicle miles traveled, especially because of the COVID years that are in there. Um, and then we looked at a, we used uh, uh, pre-treatment and post-treatment averages of, of tree crash rates. So looking at a Man whitney u test to determine the difference in the means um, between pre-treatment 2013 to 2016 and post 2017 to 2021. There were few statistically significant differences between the pre and post tree removal. Um, speed related crashes actually increased, the speed related crash rate, excuse me. Total fatality rate increased, um, but that reflects these national trends and traffic crashes that we saw with, with COVID. 
Um, one corridor, I-85, did have a statistically significant difference in the tree crash fatality rate, um, but it did have the second lowest tree removal percentage. So these are just, these are statistics kind of trying to get at this trend. But the step three, um, oh, I'll, we'll look at these charts first. Um, you can see here speed-related crashes, this is the chart, did go up. Fatal tree crashes per VMT, um, it was less, um, it was less, uh, it was not statistically significant for the change with this. So looking at a causality analysis, when I, um, uh, we were putting this together, we decided to look at difference in differences using um, seg road segments, different, a randomized set of road segments. Um, and this, uh, this is some explanation if you're not familiar with difference in differences, but it replicates a randomized control trial as best, as best we can with observational data. Um, and so this is a picture at the bottom of where the road segments were, how they were selected. There were four mile segments. Um, I started with a set of 50 random, um, random segments throughout the state and eliminated overlapping ones um, and looked, uh, looked at it there. And this is just a look at how that works. So it isolates, um, it isolates a variable and controls for all other differences that might be among or between groups or within or between the groups. So um, this looks at um, outcome variables of different types, which I'll list on the next slide. Um, and then there's the year dummy variable and then um, the tree removal, which is called treatment, um, treatment variable, and then an interaction there. So I tested all these outcomes, total crash rate, total fatality rate, speed related crashes, tree crash rate, fatal tree crash rate, tree crash fatality rate, speed related tree crash rate, and fatal speed related crash rate. Um, they, this test revealed no treatment effects. And so what this says is not that there was no difference in tree crashes, but that those differences cannot be attributed to the tree removal that happened along these segments. So the end tree removal had very little explanatory power overall, which we don't really care about R squared in, in difference and differences uh, tests. But, um, but in this case, it was, it was very low, indicating that tree removal just wasn't a big part of why these crashes were happening. So some conclusions to think about. Um, these sort of, I call them zero tolerance roadside tree narrative. That's these, the idea that trees are killers. There's a lot of dialogue um, on the roadside safety, uh, in the roadside safety world, in those circles that trees are killers. Um, and killer trees must be eliminated and things like that. And that narrative, it's, it's still prevalent, but it's hurting overall outcomes because this indiscriminate clearing um, may not address the cause of the issue. We know how speeding is being uh, started to be looked at across a lot more sectors. Um, even in the roadside safety side, they are really starting to embrace the safe systems approach. And so this supports that approach that, um, that speeding and, uh, and road design uh, looking at into speeding is, um, could, be, uh, could, can, could help ameliorate some of these tree crashes and the severity of the tree crashes. Cutting down all the trees may not address the cause of the issue. Um, and DOT employees in other fields like landscape architecture, um, ecology, they have expertise that can improve outcomes for DOTs that are more holistic than just cutting down trees to save lives when in fact that may not be what is what happens. Um, and so this is just some information from the, a, an important document from 1997 now from Federal Highway Administration to encourage highway designers and engineers to become partners with other transportation specialists and la landscape architects, environmental specialists, et cetera. So this is something that the um, that USDOT wants to encourage and is still trying to encourage. Um, there is something from our uh, this committee that I'm on for TRB. The AKD40 is the Landscape and Environmental Design Committee. Um, we are currently not involved in the roadside design guide, but we 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 hope to be in the future um, because of because of these issues. Um, they're one-sided in a lot of ways, and our input downstream could, um, or excuse me, the input upstream working together upstream could really help DOT staff downstream that are struggling with these issues. Um, here is my email address, and uh, I thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here with everyone, and I look forward to talking with you. Thank you.
All right. I'm not sure whether Alan is in uh, in the session uh, in the meeting uh, because uh, she communicated with me that uh, they were uh, in, they are in North Carolina where the hurricane is going on. Uh, but uh, anyone can share any insights? Feel free to uh, turn on your mic. Uh, well, I can share a little bit inside there. Uh, well, it's not, I mean, it's related to this research, but it just basically because uh, this research is for, uh, is based on Georgia. Uh, and so we are kind of also familiar with the Georgia, the crash data environment. Uh, so they have uh, their crash data somehow, we have to be careful for their crash data from 2000, before 2018 and after post post 2018, because the, uh, 2018, that's the uh, January 1st, that's the time they are, uh, they were uh, mandating the, uh, having the, geo the, the, the geolocations of the crashes. So before that, the January 1st, 2018, uh, there were some crashes and they, they don't, they, they did not put any the geolocations. So then, then it would cause some issues with the number of crashes you can't really count for specific segments intersections. Uh, when we had projects with Georgia DOT and we encountered that problem, we just say a significant increase of the crash numbers. Uh, uh, I mean, before 2018 and after 2018, then they, that mandate, uh, that, that rule policy explains the, uh, the, the, the change of the crash numbers. Yeah. All right, I'll just, uh, if Alan is not in the meeting, I just pass those. Uh, uh, copy those uh, comments, questions, I mean, email, emailing him, emailing her, uh, uh, but I'm not sure how that can be communicated back to you. Uh, all right, uh, feel free to get in touch with uh, Ellen. Anyway, I, I share the, her website in the chat box. Uh, all right, let me move on to our next presentation. Uh, our next presentation will be given by Dr. Uh, Dr. Li Zhao, uh, uh, who is a, a, a faculty member from the uh, uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln, and uh, his his topic is about uh, advancing advanced warning system effects on headways in rural freeway work zones. All right, uh, Dr. Li Zhao, are you here? Are you able to share your screen? Yes, I am. Uh, can you see All my right. screen right now? Yes, you can now play it. Okay, let me try. How about that? Sounds, uh, we are saying the presenter mode. Uh, not, uh, not... How to change it. Uh, you are, anyway, you are sharing a wrong monitor. I think you have multiple monitors. <laughs> yes, I do. Um. Oh, it's not working. Yeah, it's black now. Uh, now it's perfect. Okay, wonderful. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Li Zhao. And first, I want to say, uh, I hope Ellen is doing well amid the hurricane. Uh, take care. And um, so I'm from University of ne uh, Nebraska-Lincoln. And I just want to mention about my co-authors, um, they used to work with me as my colleagues, and then now they moved to Alabama. Not sure if June has met them, but they are in Auburn University. So this is a piece of work that we we have done um, into some, I guess, 20, 20, 2020 or 21. And uh, this is part of our uh, in Nebraska DOT project. Uh, it's just kind of some leftover. We want to put them together. Uh, as a as a simple uh, study, because we are interested in about the the highway distributions when there's advanced warning systems. Um, so, given there's advanced warning system, or if there's no advanced warning system, how does that impact highway distributions? So, there's this. Um, sorry, I need to on my video. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so this in uh, so this project is uh, this research is pretty straightforward. Um, I can guarantee that we do not have any theory, we do not have any models. So um, hopefully it's really easy and easy to be understood and uh, uh, makes sense to you with those results. Um, so you can sit down and have a cup of coffee or grab your lunch and follow me with um, our our 
um, topic. Um, okay. So I will start with a little bit background. What are those advanced warning systems and what do I mean by smart work zones if you are not familiar with this area? And then how do we measure these headways? And then we, I will introduce briefly about the data. And we, in this study, we only use statistic tests to say, you know, what if, uh, what if and uh, different scenarios and show you the results that we have and hopefully we have some conclusions that uh, we can discuss from. Um, so smart work zone um, in one word is, or in one sentence is about work zone that equipped with um, intelligent transportation systems or advanced technologies that in order to enhance safety and efficiency, most likely we are focusing on the safety side. Um, so I have a, a, a picture uh, on the lower bottom. Uh, as you see, uh, this is a work zone on the up up corner, uh, up, right, up left corner, and you have sensors at the work zone and you detect what's going on in the work zone, what's the traffic conditions, and then relay this information to the drivers on the up uh, for those upcoming drivers on uh, in the upstream. Um, and there are multiple ways to show those informations, either use mobile phones or on-site um, devices on your vehicle, or what we are looking at today is about you know, the roadside um, dynamic message signs, which you have information, uh, give you some information or ask you what you should do. Uh, so some critical features about this system, uh, about the work zones, should be they should be automatic firstly and real, real time. So the traffic, traffic flow and traffic condition on the work zones changing every minute. So we want to provide the, uh, the update information and we want to be we want this system to be portable because work zone is changing, right? It moves to one place to another. So you do not want to have a fixed location and then you know install and destroy it. Um awareness, of course, because this uh, the work zone and the systems, uh, the mass board could depart about up to a mile or few miles. Um and reliable, um that's that's kind of important because we want to drive uh, driver to listen to our system. We want to provide reliable information of uh, what happening and when they go uh, approach the work zone and this is really what uh, they say and they listen to your message. So they trust your system. And action board really means um, you want to provide some information that driver really know what to do rather than just provide warning, but you want do you want the driver to stop uh, in advance or you want them to slow down at what speed. Um, so you want to have some actionable uh, message on the board. Um, there are a lot of applications to that. Um, you can you can ex uh, you can detect where are those back of the queues because we don't want driver to be surprised when they rush into the end of the queue. Um, we can look at the end, uh, the late merge at the work zone, or we can do some road diversions um, when there are different options, and especially when the work zone is is congested heavily, and you want to divert some of the vehicles to other road if if it's possible. So those are typical um, um, applications for the smart work zone, and. Uh, especially for the advanced warning systems. Um, here, I provide a very typical layout for these advanced warning systems. Uh, as I just showed you before, you, first you should have detectors, either just at least one detector or a bunch of detectors along the work zone. And then um, you can have uh, speed or other factors. Uh, average speed is most, uh, most used uh, parameters that can um, be translated to some criteria that you put on the message board, the dynamic message signs. Um, so different states, I guess they use different algorithms and, and the threshold to define when is the free flow speed. So there's nothing you need to, to display or what is the 
slow speed what is a congested or stop or stop um, traffic um, so in uh, here I showed the the threshold we use in Nebraska 45 miles per hour above that then is free flow um, between so remember the the uh, speed limit at uh, interest we're not here I'm sorry I'm talking about the interstate uh, speed limit when you're close to work zone the, the speed limit uh, is 55 miles per hour so above 45 miles per hour um, a counted as um, free flow and between 25 to 45 miles per hour, those are slow traffic. So the you will see message like you want to slow down because there are slow traffic ahead. And uh, below 25 miles per hour, then that means there's queue, uh, queuing up to, uh, to upstream. So that's where you want to stop and you, you prepare to stop and, um, that's about the algorithm, and then for the for the uh, dynamic message signs, you put that into some distance, like one mile, two mile, four miles upstream. Um, when where you want to put that, depending on um, you know the expert uh, ex uh, experts and then the decisions made by them. And especially, we want to do some preliminary study on what are the typical cue. Um, that the queue lens, right? You don't want to see, you don't want to have the drivers to meet the end of queue before they see this message board, then that message board is useless because they already uh, stopped. Um, so the at least one of those message boards should go beyond the queue. Um, so that's about the layout of this uh, advanced warning systems as a part of this smart work zone application. Um, that's what I want to talk about today as a background. So uh, here, I, I just want to show you one more thing about the, the actual deployment of this system in Nebraska. Um, so those are, um, so we have a massive uh, management center. We have all this data automatically feed in to our center uh, in, in, in Nebraska DOT. Um, they can see the cameras, which typically put that uh, at the beginning of the work zone, and you have sensors which they collect the speed, and then they have another speed uh, sensors at one mile away, and then the message board on um, two miles and four miles uh, in distance. And then they just do average, um, specifically rolling average. Every three minutes, they have an average and use this average speed to uh, control what message you want to, to uh, display. Uh, so uh, um, for this for today's presentation, I really want to zoom into headway measurement. Um, uh, uh, background, uh, background of the background, why we do headway measurement, because uh, when we finish this, uh, when, we, when we collect this data for our project about the smart work zone, uh, the project is about the effective, effectiveness of those advanced assist, advanced warning system in smart work zones. And we use some, um, we need to collect some data. So we use all those automatic way to collect, uh, you know, Bluetooth data, uh, space mean speed and travel time. And then we also have camera data. Um, and when we try to calibrate those data, we use our own algorithms and own um, uh, sensors. We manually um, measure some some um, some data like the speed, the location, and the timestamps. And then we we have a like I will show you the sample size, but we have a lot of those data. Um, Thank you for that, the note. So we have a lot of data. So um, we want we want to see okay, um, can we get those stamp, stamp, uh, time stamps um, to get the headways and see the how did the headway changed as a surrogate safety or surrogate operational measure to see how the effectiveness of these advanced warning systems. So that's where we have this headway measurement, and I just want you. Why you, you wonder why we just do this manually. I will show you manually checking about the Halloween measures. Uh, so we put cameras here. That's one of the, our cameras. We have five cameras along the side. Um, and we um, and then when the vehicles go towards to, this is a reference line that we put like water line. And then we ask students to count whenever there's a vehicle passing through this line uh, by, by then this is in there 
most of them, least the outer most of them. And then you write down the timestamps. So that's a very typical way you collect the headways. Uh, and we're not talking about headways, really uh, time handle headway. And also we write down what type of vehicle. So we have uh, passenger cars and heavy vehicles, these two types. And then when top when we talk about the headway, you want to uh, specify by which one is the leading, which is the following. Uh, so in that way, we have four types of these pairs of pass passenger vehicle following a passenger vehicle, sorry, the previous is the, the leading vehicle and the last one is the following vehicle. So a uh, passenger car, car following a, head, a heavy vehicle and heavy vehicle following a passenger car, heavy vehicle following a head of heavy vehicle. Um, and then we just calculate the time difference, right, between every two vehicles in that lane. So that's the time headway. Um, and uh, that's it. That's all the information we get from the data. Um, the, let me go back to, to just address one more thing. Why we want to do this? Because in our hypothesis, we think smaller headways um, would be potentially dan danger. Uh, when you talk about, talk about like close car following within one, sen one second compared to if you car following with five seconds, then obviously you are, the closer you are following the the leading vehicle, then the the higher risk you will have. Um, so we want to look at that situation in safety perspective, and also in operational perspective, we want to look at uh, how does the you know the traffic flow changes. Um, in uh, we have hypoth our hypothesis will be you know the wider highway you have then because the traffic flow is the reverse of the highway in microscopic uh, levels. So the wider tra uh, highway you have, then that means the traffic is denser compared to, to if they are closely related, then, oh, sorry, I, I, I guess, um, excuse me, I, I had that. So when you traffic highway is closer, then that means it's, it's denser. Because uh, that makes sense, right? And when the highway is larger, then that means you have more freedom, you have more space to uh, to following, then the traffic is more sparse. Um, so we want to look at these two parts in operation and in safety levels. How does that change? Um, uh, especially when we add this advanced warning system, because in literature, we found that we a lot of study talking about highway distribution. And highway distribution sometimes is important because you... Um, when you do simulation calibration, for example, headway distribution is one of the, those important fact in, uh, parameters that you want to put into your simulation model. And also you want to do theory about traffic flow uh, in the microscope le level, then headway distribution, that's something people are looking at. Um, but there's no study, um, no results talking about if there's advanced warning system joining in or in the smart work zone, what would that be change the you know the landscape or the the distribution of the the highway? So our study is just a very small thing that meet this gap. So it's just a very small gap that we want to look at in our using our uh, manually collected data. All right. So um, the data summary I we used to um, test site in total in our project we have six or eight um, smart work loans we looked at, but manually data collection it was only for these two locations. Um, and then both locations are two to one. Uh, so which means you, in the main lane have two lane and at the work zone, the one lane was closed and dropped to one lane. Um, speed limit from 55 to uh, 75 to 55 miles per hour in the work zone. And um, they are both in rural areas. Um, so, and what are information I need? Okay, that's, so the track percentage, so you can see in urban area, we have track percentage about 5%, 10%, that level. But in Nebraska, especially West Nebraska, we have track percentage up to even 60% or 70%. I saw those data. Um, but at these two locations specifically, the track percentage about 30%, 40%, 40 or 50%, but still kind of high uh, in terms of track percentage. Um, so that's something we, that's why one of the reasons why one, we want to look at um, tracks uh, in these uh, uh, com combinations. 
Um, so as I mentioned, we only use hubs of statistical test to check for the data. Uh, we use a very simple t-test to look at their means, if they, they are differing means. And also we are interested to see their distribution um, to see if these two types have uh, a distinct distributions or not. Um, when I talk about compare, comparison, it's, it's something with uh, uh, advanced warning uh, system compared to those without advanced warning system. So that, keep that in mind. Most of the study, we divide the data into these two parts and compare between them. We also use a uh, chi-square test um, to look at um, the, the, the goodness of fit and also KS test to see what else. Uh, so when we look at the distribution between two uh, scenarios, and for each scenario, we want to look at that this distribution is better fit within like normal distribution or other types of distribution. Um, we have both um, prim parameter or non-parametric -param um, distributions that we try to fit in with a standard or theoretical um, distribution so that in, in the end of the day, you do not need to remember all those different distribution and parameters, you just know that this is a, what kind of distribution and, and that will help you in, hopefully in your in your future study when you look at these different distributions. So that's our um, idea on this. So let me go uh, into the results. Uh, first of all, or first we look at overall with warning, uh, with the warning when uh, that means the advanced warning system or without any warning system when which means when the system is turned off so sometimes it, so the system is not always turned off so sometimes if, if it's off then what happened and then the it shows that uh the mean headway is then is significantly um let me see uh longer for no warning situations compared to warning situations and their distributions are different. Um, I will discuss a little bit about the, the results, but let me go over um, of, of all those results first. And the length position. So I com we compared with um, the, the vehicles on the innermost lane or outermost lane and with and without warning systems. Um, and uh, before that, we have some like some findings about like most uh, um, Heavy vehicles are traveling in the outer lane than the inner lane, which makes sense because that's what we do for for uh, running uh, HVs on on the interstate. And then the headways in the inner lane is greater than the headways on the outer lane. So it means in in the inner inner lane, traffic are more compared comparatively more dense than traffic on the outer lanes. And it could be because the outer lane vehicles are trying to merge into the inner line. So the outer line have a, a, a bigger space among those uh, vehicles. And then when we compared with for inner line, um, the, the message, uh, the, um, the mean headway um, did, so the, the uh, message board does not impact the headway, so there's no difference. But for outer lens, then the difference shows up. So um, the with, with this distribution, with this um, um, message, uh, dynamic message, you have a, a higher, um, you have a higher headways compared to with, without. Um, then we also look at uh, different types of vehicles, leading, lagging, uh, sorry, leading following pairs. Um, the result we have a lot of results from here. I just I just mentioned four that are critical to me. Let me see about that. Um, so two things I may just mention it that um, so for uh, especially for high uh, um vehicle that for, uh, uh, sorry heavy vehicles that that as a follower they behave like more cautious, which means they have a higher, um, they have a they have a larger uh, mean distance compared to the 
um, the passenger cars and passenger car behaves like they have their variability is, is larger compared to um, heavy vehicles. So that's the, I think that's the major conclusions or findings we have here. Um, and then we look at the distributions for different types of these combinations. And our conclusion was that for no warning states, log normal distribution can be used to describe the hideaways, which is, uh, we found uh, several studies in literature, they also report this type of distribution that can be used for no warning states, which means there's no advanced warning as a normal or traditional situation. And for warning uh, situation, that's where this study uh, tried to contribute to the literature. For those warning states, uh, log normal still works for those um, those uh, heavy heavy vehicle that as a follower, so it could the leading vehicle could be passenger car or could be a, a heavy vehicle, but the follower is a heavy vehicle. And then in this situation, log normal is still work, is still working. So and I, I think this is equals to the previous uh, result that heavy vehicle is more cautious. Um, but uh, for if the passenger car uh, is a follower, and no matter the leading is passenger car or, or a heavy vehicle, then this not normal distribution does not work. Instead, we use this non-parametric um, distribution, which is gas, uh, a Gaussian uh, kernel distribution that can be used to describe uh, this type of uh, um, this type of car following situation, uh, oh, sorry, this type of combinations uh, given there's a warning states. Uh, and then uh, we really look at the uh, car following situation. When I talk about car following situation, we use four seconds as a cutoff. So previously the, the, uh, the highway could be up to 20 minutes. As long as there are two vehicles um, passing through that line, you will have a time difference. But when we talk about car following situation in literature, they, there are a lot of thresholds. Some people use 1.5 seconds, two seconds, four seconds, six seconds, and it, I saw eight seconds, maybe I, if I remember correctly, but at, at least six uh, seconds. Um, in our paper, we showed all those uh, uh, references um, and we decided to use four seconds as cutoff. So all those headways, um, time headways are smaller than four seconds. We put them together and then look look at the no warning and warning situation again. And in this situation, our hypothesis would be the closer you are, then the riskier you are facing. Um, and then well, warning, warning, uh, for the situation that there's advanced warning, then the uh, headway is longer compared to no warning, which means this system, when the system is uh, turns on, then you have you have the driver to slow down. And because of this slowdown, and you just get the, the following distance longer or the following time longer. Uh, and this helps to, uh, because our hypothesis is like longer um, headway will be safer. Um, so in other words, this warning system have to reduce or mitigate the risk of rear end crash, um, if that makes sense to you. Um, so um, we try to use this way to help us to understand using a circuit safety measure, not directly the number of crashes, but the you know the re the driver behavior, their car following behavior, to see if the system really helps to um, to uh, mitigate or uh, driver really comply or listen to your your advice about slow down. And if they do slow down, then your highway will be longer. Um, because that's safer based on our hypothesis. So I guess uh, I uh, the the conclusion uh, um, we try to verify the effectiveness of the advanced warning system um, from these headway distributions, and we try to provide an alternative way to verify this effect effectiveness because in our uh, project overall what we use was very um, compli com uh, complicated. We have five cameras, we have different time uh, speed change. We want to see a speed profile. Do we, 
that driver really reduce their speed. But right now, use headway, it just gives you, you just need one point, right? And give you some insight about uh, if the system is working or if if the driver compliance the system by looking at their headway distributions. So that's the objectives, and we think we 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 are satisfied with the results and the contributions. And I th I guess I mentioned that you know just if you just look at for the uh, advanced warning systems in work zones, I didn't we did not find in the literature there are report about those. Uh, scenarios and hopefully we can meet that gap by providing some type of distribution and some parameters in our paper we give a specific parameters that if you want to use in calibrating your simulation model or you want to use in your um, traffic flows theory it could you could refer, refer to our our study so with that um i guess i will stop here and i'm open to any questions you have thank you all right, thank you, Dr. Zhao. And uh, any questions from the audience before I ask my questions? All right, okay, I'll just go ahead and ask my questions. So you have the data from the low warning periods. I'm just wondering, uh, did you guys purposely turn off the system to collect data? Yeah. Um... No, uh, so the so the system will so uh, this no warning means um, when there's the traffic is lower and then it they did not trigger you know the message. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So 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 for the two no warning and warning periods, basically the traffic conditions are totally different. Um. Or their time yes. is actually different. Yes. Are, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, that's that's a critical point, and thanks for asking that because I did not mention that clearly. Uh, let me go back to this side. The the traffic condition in work zone are totally different because you know when you have um no volume, that means this free flow in work zone area, right? And if it's um. If it's you have a message, then the work zone maybe they have slow traffic or stop traffic. But what we collect data, uh, where we collect data, if you could follow my mouse, um, that's the camera is on the message board two, number two. And at this location, we just make sure that there's no queue that driver uh you know that can they can see there's queue. So even though, for example, the tra the you can see the traffic. Uh, there's queue, maybe they just reach to a uh, mess message board one because we will recheck re the cameras on the other way. And then, so if you are driver, look as a uh, drive uh, at the message uh, number two at this area, you do not know anything about that in work zone. You are only rely on this message and the road is clear. So at this moment, the all the traffic flow in message board two are free flow. There's no queue, mm -hmm. there's no speed reduction. It's only say, okay, work, in work zone area, um, traffic is slowed or they are stop traffic. So do you want to prepare to slow, uh, you want to prepare to stop or you want to slow down? But there's no sign showing the driver in the road that traffic has changed. So that's the very important part I want to mention. Yeah. All right. Yeah, sounds good. And uh... Because you are trying to understand the impact of the warning systems on the traffic, basically yeah, meters and the, the headways. Um, mm -hmm. But however, I feel like the the factor, the key factor, which is the warning and no warning, the system activation, of the system, this 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 factor is not purely independent. Uh, you say that they are triggered by the traffic conditions, and traffic mm -hmm. conditions come back to then would be somehow we know lower traffic great headways and uh, high traffic, heavy traffic and uh, short headways. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's yeah. Uh, it's not purely independent. So I'm just thinking about the analysis can be strengthened by enhanced by accounting for the traffic conditions or time of day. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that may isolate the, the, eff uh, the effect of the warning systems on the traffic. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree that, with that. And, and in fact, uh, um, Dr. Kapak, Asad Kapak also mentioned um, that there are 
there are some problem with because I uh, we submit this paper before, and uh because of traffic conditions um and I I think that's something we need to dig deeper um. Um, uh, given the current situation. And at the very beginning, we thought, you know, that because all the traffic, at this location, the traffic flow are free, free flow, so there's nothing different from the driver's perspective Be beside this warning sign. Because we when we check about the all the camera at this location, and uh, th this camera locations, the, the traffic all most likely the same because we count number of vehicles um, with and without um, this warning message, the traffic, um, the, the traffic are coming, or number of counts are change, changing, but the vehicle, the, the speed does not change. So they maintain their free flow speed. That's something we feel like, okay, given that situation for, for a specific driver, they, they only rely on this message and the traffic flow, we are on, on God's eyes, we know that you know overall track flow changes, but for this specific driver, they may or may not aware of those changes. Uh, so that's I think that's an assumption I we made for this paper, and but I agree with you. It could be some external factors that may impact the the, the results, and we will look at that further. Yep, but uh, thank you. All right, that sounds good, and uh, I think you've done good way, great work. And this, I mean, I think the data collection part is really great effort. Uh, so with the data and just try to get the most value of the data. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Zhao. And now we are moving forward to our next speaker, and we actually had uh, we scheduled six uh presentations for this session, but we. One of the uh, presentation that the presenter is unavailable. And so we are now just moving towards our last speaker uh, given by uh, Ke Ya Li uh, from University of Texas, Austin, uh, who is a uh, currently a PhD student uh, working with, uh, working with uh, Dr. Kara Cookman. And uh, her, well, I speak. Did I? Well, yeah. Okay. All right. The, the, the title of her presentation is Smartphone Based Methods for Automatic Speed Enforcement. All right. Kaya, are you uh, ready? Yeah. Let me share my screen. And um, again, you have really, I mean, 27 minutes to go. So feel free to take advantage of the time. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Liu. <laughs> all right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here during the lunch time. And thank you, Dr. Liu, for monitoring this section for us. So my name is Kaya Li, and I'm currently a first year PhD student in transportation engineering at UT Austin. So I'm happy to be here today to share our work with you, smartphone-based method for speed limit enforcement. So safety is a big topic in transportation. According to World Health Organization, uh, nearly 1.2 million people die globally each year in road traffic crashes. And speeding is a major contributor to the U.S. crashes, and 29% of U.S. fatal crashes are speeding related. So to better monitor speeding and catching speeders, as of now, we can see from the figure that 90 U.S. states and Washington, D.C. permits the use of speed cameras, while nine states prohibit speed cameras. Uh, but public agency cameras cost uh, approximately uh, 120000 uh, for hardware and also 30000 per year for operation and maintenance, uh, which are very expensive, actually. However, smartphones can permit anyone to report speeding and other dangerous driving at all times and in all settings, uh, which are much cheaper and practical than fixed speed cameras. So in this way, uh, we are hoping to propose a smartphone-based method for speed limit enforcement. Uh, in our work, a comprehensive framework is developed. Uh, we seek speed inference and also vehicle identification to assist in traffic law enforcement. Uh, the, the input of our system would be the smartphone recorded uh, videos and our machine learning output 
uh, would be the speed and also vehicle information, uh, including the license plate, color, make and uh, model. So this output information can help informants agencies identify offenders and also take actions. Uh, now I will explain the uh, implementation of our system uh, step by step. In each input video, it may include many video frames. So the figure. Is my internet having a problem or the presenter? I think the presenters. Oh. All right, I think that's the presenter having uh, is disconnected. Let's see if uh, she can reconnect over soon. I'm actually very curious about the speed information. Uh, that's uh, actually, I feel like that's a, uh, I mean, at least for me or for my team, that's the most critical challenging part uh, for estimating the speed of objects uh, when we up detect the objects in the frame. Uh, All right, let's just wait a few more minutes, uh, or seconds, if she can rejoin. So smartphone based message, that's a crowdsourced, crowdsourced speed enforcement. <laughs> All right, Kaya, you are now uh, rejoining. Can you please share your screen again? Hi, sorry for the internet. That, that's all right. Uh, I didn't realize it, sorry. Uh, I guess I can share my screen. Yeah, should I? But I didn't, I didn't know where I stopped it. Could you remind me? Yeah, you just finished that slide. Oh, this one? F the framework, the, the, the framework slide, this one. Yeah, you finished this one. Oh, I finished this one. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So now I will explain the implementation of our speed and vehicle identification system step by step. So in each uh, input video, uh, it may include many video frames. Uh, so the figure on the right is one example of the video frame. The entire system process uh, video, uh, so each uh, video body uh, will be included in the separate uh, uh, bonding box and be passed to the next step. Uh, in this process, uh, ULO V8 is, detect is used to detect the vehicle body. And the other part of the frame, like uh, road segments, will be neglected in, the, in this step. After that, uh, deep sort and strong sort are used to track and connect vehicle bodies across uh, multiple frames. Since one video may have several frames, so we are, we are actually tracking vehicles by naming them with uh, different IDs. And for each vehicle, its speed is estimated by a bounding box and the vanishing points. So vanishing points are essential in determining objects' speed. In previous work, uh, many articles determine the first vanishing point by extending the roadways and finding the intersection point. So in our work, uh, the first vanishing point is the intersection point of two straight lines. And the second uh, vanishing point would be on the equivalent say of the first vanishing point. After getting these two vanishing points, uh, travel distance uh, would, would equal to the product of distance traveled in the video and the scale factor. The scale factor actually is calculated by the average US vehicle length divided by the extra length in this video. And after obtaining the distance traveled, the vehicle speed uh, would be the vehicle traveled per frame uh, multiply the frame rate. And the frame, weight, uh, frame rate is normally 30. After uh, finishing uh, the speed uh, estimation, we still need to get other vehicle information, including the vehicle make and model, license plate, and color. 
So in so in this step, the ResNet50 is used for the make and model inference. Currently, uh, many uh, vehicle make and model identification methods are based on some vehicles, which are not that common nowadays and actually inapplicable in the US. So we identify the US uh, most uh, 100 most popular vehicles from the year 2017 National Household Travel Service uh, trip records based on the total VMT by sampled households. So in order to solve this problem and make the system can be updated uh, every year easily afterwards, we first uh, pre-train our model on the VMM RDB dataset. Uh, the data sets include more than 291,000 images of more than 9,000 vehicle classes, and then retrain the last layer on more than 15,000 images of the US uh, 100 most popular vehicles. After that, uh, data augmentation is also added as the final step, uh, which includes four transformations. The Gaussian blur can provide a model with different levels of blurred images, and uh, the horizontal flip can remove the bias towards the vehicle directions. Uh, random rotation can help enable the model to see the vehicle from different angles, which is very, which always happen in real life when we're trying to record the vehicles. And the color filter can reduce the color bias by changing different aspects of color. So after these four uh, transformations, uh, the model can deal with the real world issues like the uh, dark environment and also blurry uh, recordings. So at the same time, um, colors are detected by uh, uh, the first algorithm KNN, which include which can detect eight base colors, and also another algorithm color detect, uh, which can detect all possible RGB colors are used here. And ULO V7 is used for license plate detection. After uh, we did, upon we detecting the license plate, the characters are inferred uh, by the real ESR game and fine tune ECOCR. So finally, the speed and vehicle information are displayed uh, for each car. The example output uh, would look like this table. It will present the vehicle ID in a frame and vehicle classes, which includes the car, truck, and bus here, and their um, probability, and also the speed, uh, most frequent color detected by the first algorithm, KN, and top three prevalent colors and their shares detected by the second algorithm, color detect, uh, and also top three make and models and their confidence and top 10 planes estimate and their confidence are also included in our output. So as our result, uh, we first test our uh, license plate identification model on uh, 1,800 images from the UFPR ARPR dataset. Uh, this dataset is a Brazil dataset, uh, which includes more than 30,000 images of 150 vehicles. So we can see from the table that the uh, that the uh, license plate detection model can predict 78.5% bounding box correctly, uh, covering more than 70% area of the true one. A uh, single easy OCR can only predict 14% of characters accurately, but with the help of super resolution the accuracy can increase to 22.6%. And uh, with the easy OCR being fine-tuned, the correctness can reach up to 47.1%, which is uh, much higher than the original 14%. Uh, meanwhile, we also test uh, our model in real-world scenarios. Uh, we collected 73 smartphone-recorded videos which are four to five seconds per uh, each, and also 42 traffic camera recordings, which are two to three seconds each for Austin, Texas roadways. So, uh, so the results show that the color prediction reaches uh, 61 accuracy for exact uh, color prediction. 
and the accuracy of actual make uh, is a uh, top three predictions is 49%, uh, 49%, while that of actual make and model is only 17. Uh, regarding the speed, uh, 16 speed, uh, uh, predicted speeds are within 20% of actual ones. And 30% uh, of license plates uh, are predicted among top 10 predictions. Uh, we can find that color and make achieve a relatively high accuracy while others are perform performing unsatisfactory. So the possible reasons can be uh, the noise of other vehicles in the video and also the limit of our camera resolution and other aspects. So the before system shows the feasibility of smartphone-based method for speed limit enforcement. To discuss, uh, to further discuss the real-world application, we also delivered a survey to 14 enforcement officers around the U.S. And the, their responses are mainly about top concerns, uh, including public perception, privacy, safety, and also the practicality of the automated. Uh, enforcement. So uh, the respondents feel like uh, the U.S. still have major uh, challenges for application of automated speed and also including red light running enforcement. So in comparison, the European Union's uh, camera application, uh, especially the two-point application, are uh, preferred by them. So they feel like Americans are still unaware of the benefits of automated uh, enforcement. Um, regarding the feasibility, uh, the, response, uh, the respondents uh, recommend low fine policies to avoid uh, money grab appearance. And also, uh, when we deal with the real world uh, video submission, some uh, fake video submission can hurt others. And also, uh, drivers can be distracted by the speedy enforcement technology easily, which is also another e big issue. Uh, as another uh, alternate, uh, as another commonly used way to help enforcement, speed limiter is also uh, widely used. Built-in speed governor are the easiest way to limit top speeds by the vehicle existing electronic control units. Uh, look like the figure here. Currently, the speed governor are mentoring for all new vehicle sales in Singapore, China, uh, Ghana, UK, and European and other countries. But in the US, uh, although many most, most US heavy truck fleet owners install governor uh, in their vehicles, but that is not the case for uh, the common passenger vehicles. So we can find like there is still a long way to go for the US to make the speed governor mentoring. Another, another idea proposed by people is the monitoring only app designed for tracking and warning. But that one still have issues with uh, mark, mar market interest and politics. And also the application of this kind of software require a very comprehensive database of road and speed limit. So it may need a lot of work here. Um, so uh, therefore, uh, the combination of computer vision and enforcement is promoting and natural for us. So in summary, uh, our study demonstrates the potential and uh, feasibility of a smartphone-based method in the content of automated speed enforcement to improve road safety. This framework can envision further individual engagement in regulating traffic laws and the autonomous technology involvement uh, in this process. So thank you for listening. And you can find our paper at the link provided. Uh, we are open to any advice or questions here. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Kaya. Uh, this is a really cool idea. I think a lot of people uh, would have some questions and concerns about this um, technology. Uh, and, and we, I mean, yes, uh, well, uh, all right, Ali, you have any, any other comments to share? We have 10 minutes to discuss this topic.
All right, I'll go ahead. Uh, you can go back to your uh, slides showing all the accuracies. Uh, yeah, yes. Oh, this this one or this, yeah, this, this one. one. Just this okay. one. Just look at the speed accuracy. You say that they predicted speed within twenty percent of the actual. Uh, but you do know that our the speed enforcement. Uh, well, if it's within uh some kind of uh, like five ten miles above the speed limit, so you normally they would not issue a ticket. Uh. How this can really because look like here it looks like just uh, not very accurate or uh, because given this kind of inaccuracy of prediction I mean how this enforcement can be done by the law enforcement officers. Yeah, thank you. Like this is a very good question. Actually, uh, yeah, I uh, we are also unsatisfied with the accuracy of the speed here. So our goal here is to propose like we can use this system in practice, but it is not perfect. It is still at a very early stage. And I would say like the inaccuracy of the speed here is because of since we are recording the videos by our, our hand. So the movement of our hand and also the noise from other vehicles can disturb the estimation of the speed, which may may cause the speed is very inaccurate here and and also the other part of like uh issue the speeders uh, we are not try to predict uh, like try to make the enforcement agency issue tickets just based on this system but use this one as a supplement when they trying to issue the tickets yeah but we are still improving this algorithm all right okay well, because that's what I heard. I mean, that's I learned uh, the radar gun. They have also a inaccuracy, some kind of plus minus five miles per hour, ten miles per hour. That's one of the reasons why they do not issue a ticket if the speed is just five or ten miles above the speed limit. Uh, because wow. that inaccuracy, thing. because people people can argue my speed is not really that high. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, Okay, yeah, this is uh well, I mean, but however, I, I think the, the technology, uh technologically, I think you can we can address it given the computer vision. Uh but however, but this kind of I'm thinking about because this involves the the regular, I mean, I mean general public to participate. And mm -hmm. then how the public would perceive this. That's uh, I mean, you have mentioned about that uh, they, they, because people can submit some really fake videos, and now with AI, really we can make videos. I mean, look like real. I mean, we can just uh, modify a little bit, and for example, just modify the plates uh, or the color of the vehicles, and then we, if we know our labor's uh, vehicle, we can just place our labor's vehicle in the video. Say that is high speeding. Uh, and then the laborers have to show proof of not presenting. Uh, uh, I mean, there. Uh, that's. I'm. I'm just. I'm just have so many concerns about uh, about this technology. Uh, yeah. Here, I here, feel like. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is someone talking? Yeah, I'm totally agree with you because when we're trying to propose this framework, uh, we want to like uh, adopt it in our real world application. But yeah, as we talk to many people in this field, we also have the same concern about how like people would be like use this uh, application and will will it have like many disadvantage when we try to use it? Yeah, but I guess it's still a long way to go when we trying to uh, make the individual engagement in this process. Yes, yes. Thank you, Julie, for sharing your insights. I think that's uh, uh that's uh, I think I agree with that. And that's a good point. And well, one more thing. Uh, well, that was okay. Yeah, they I mean, speaking of the technologies to improve our transmission systems, and this is one of the ways. And uh, I'm also thinking about it's the same I mean, similar. Um, it's it. I mean, I'm I'm talking about the purpose. The objective is trying to uh uh is trying to enforce the traffic tra traffic speed, the speed of vehicles. I'm just thinking about other technology, the connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles. Mm. Uh, with the connected vehicles, the vehicles are going to talk to the infrastructures. So then they're going to talk about their speeds. That is more accurate because that is actually the speed of the vehicles. Uh, but I'm not sure that is going to be used for enforcing the speeds. 
Uh, yeah, I would say like it's still a privacy issue and also concern. Like if they can, if if other like agency can get the speed of like everyone's vehicle, which is a very like a tricky stuff. I know some like insurance comp company they would sell the um the speed of the, the speed and also other use usage of the vehicle to some agencies. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but I feel like it would be it's it's a very like a privacy concern people would would be worried about. All right. Uh, we we do have one uh audience uh raising hand uh. Sajad, you can speak up. Sajad, oh, thanks. I yes, uh, I was writing to uh, make me unmute. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks, Kia, for nice presentation. Um, I'm listening from Toronto, Canada. Uh, very nice presentation. So actually, um, um, about the technology and prediction algorithm, um, yes, we are at this stage that we are still growing and improving about these algorithms. But I was, um, you know, <clears throat> considering how you want to replace this technology, like the existing law enforcement cameras. Um, do you want to replace it with smartphones? Uh, is it what you are, uh, you are uh, like... Uh, um considering in your research like i did not understand that how you will use this technology uh on, on the roads yeah thank you for the question uh uh our initial goal is not to replace the like the speed cameras and also the existing enforcement camera actually we want to use the smartphone uh, enforcement as a supplement and also you know like in the US, not many places they would have the cameras. So people are speeding in these kind of areas. So we are trying to alert people or kind of you can submit the videos to report to the corresponding uh, agencies to deal with this, uh, to deal with the speedings in these kind of areas without the speed cameras. So it's just a supplement, not like a replacement. Mm, I see. I mean, I was just wondering, like the pictures and frames that you sh uh, you have shown in your presentation, like they must have from specific uh, angle, right? To to capture the full, uh, like a uh, uh, full uh, body of the car, uh, or mm. so. So that's what I was uh, thinking about. But anyways, I mean, yes, this there is a long way to go to to reach that level. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let's keep contact. <laughs> yeah. All right, Kenya. I think that's uh. I mean, anyway, it's a it's a cool idea, and I also. I mean, I know Dr. Karkokman's style, and she can always come up with really cool ideas. And uh, it may have a lot of issues or concerns at the beginning, but uh, then with the more research going on, that uh, some of the problems concerns can be addressed, and then may, may spark really new cool more ideas. Uh, Thank you, yeah. Kia. And uh, do you have any last uh, remarks? Uh no. Actually, yeah, we are free, free, like feel free to connect us if you have any advice on our research. Actually. All right. Thank, thank you, Kia. Thank you so much. All right. I'd like to use the last minute in the session to uh kind of uh, promote our uh the uh next uh, I mean next three sessions uh, in the afternoon. Uh, one stage session five, active transport, transportation and transit, uh, mod moderated by uh, Dr. Sanjana Hossein from Uri University of Toronto. And uh, there is a session six, uh, travel demand and transport choices, uh, moderated by uh, Priyaka uh, Pasanka from UT Austin. And the session seven is going to be mod uh, is, uh, also transit planning and policy, moderated by Dr. Fenemy and uh, uh, University of Connecticut. And uh, everyone, you are feel free to uh, stay and uh,